Hello, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good people. My name is Martin Imora Gawamuraidi. And uh, let me pour some water over here. And uh, today I'm continuing reading The Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli. I'll be reading chapter 20 today. And uh, welcome. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, please subscribe, like the video. It'll be much appreciated. Anyway, chapter 20 is called Whether fortresses and other strategies rulers frequently adopt are useful. To hold power more securely, some rulers have disarmed their citizens. Some have kept subject towns divided in factions. Some have encouraged hostility towards themselves. Others have sought to win over who were initially suspicious over their rise to power. Some have built fortresses, others have torn them down and destroyed them. And though one can't pass final judgment on these policies without detailed knowledge of the states where such decisions were taken, all the same, I shall try to discuss the matter in general terms as far as is possible. No one new to power has ever disarmed his subjects. On the contrary, finding them disarmed, new rulers have always armed them. When you're giving the one, when you're the one giving people arms, those arms become yours. Men who were potentially hostile become loyal, while those are already loyal become your supporters rather than your subjects. It's true you can't arm everyone, but in favoring some, you can feel safer about the others too. Seeing that they've preferred, seeing that they've been preferred, the men you've armed will be under an obligation to you. The others won't be resentful. Understanding that the people facing danger for you and binding their lives to yours will inevitably deserve the greater rewards. But when you take arms away from people, then you start to upset them. You show you don't trust them because you're frightened or cagey. Either way, they'll begin to hate you. Then, since you can hardly manage without an army, you'll have to turn to mercenary forces, which will have all the failings I discussed earlier. And if your mercenaries, and even if your mercenaries are good, they'll never be good enough to defend you against powerful enemies and a hostile people. So, as I said, a new ruler in a newly constituted state has always um, armed his subjects. History offers endless examples. But when a ruler acquires a new territory to add like an extra limb to an existing state, then he must disarm its people, except for the men who supported him when he took it. But with time and opportunity, even those men should be kept weak and emasculated so that all the real armed force in the state as a whole resides within your own soldiers who live with you in your home base. Generations ago, the experts in Florence used to say that you, hold, you had to hold Pistoia by playing on its factions and Pisa by holding its fortresses. So they encouraged, they encouraged factionalism in some of the towns they held, the better to control them. In times when there was a certain balance between opposing parties in Italy, this was probably an effective policy, but I don't think we should take it as a rule today. I don't think factional divisions ever really improved the situation. On the contrary, when an enemy approaches, 
a subject town that's divided in factions will fall at once. The weaker of the factions will always join forces with the attacker, and the factions and the other factions won't be strong enough to beat them both. The Venetians were reasoning along the same lines, I believe, when they fomented divisions between Guelphs and Ghibellines in the towns they held. They didn't let the factions get as far as bloodshed, but encouraged divergences so that people would be too busy with their own disputes to unite against Venice. It wasn't, as things turned out, a successful policy. After the Venetians defeat at Vaila, one or other of the factions immediately took courage and seized control of the various towns. This kind of policy actually indicates weak weakness on a ruler's part. In a healthy, confident state, such differences would never be allowed. They're only useful in peacetime when they make it easier to keep people under control. In times of war, everyone can see how flawed the policy is. There's no doubt that rulers achieve greatness by overcoming the obstacles and enemies they find in their path. So when destiny wants to make a ruler great, particularly a new ruler who, unlike a hereditary king, really needs to build up his reputation, it sends him enemies and prompts them to attack him. That way, he has the chance to beat them and climb the ladder his enemies have put in front of him. Hence, many people reckon that when the opportunity presents itself, a smart ruler will shrewdly provoke hostility so that he can then increase his reputation by crushing it. Rulers, and especially those new to power, have found that men they initially doubted prove more loyal and useful than those they trusted. Pandolfo Petrucci ran Siena more, than, more with the men he had doubted than the others. But it's hard to lay down firm rules here because things vary from case to case. I'll just say this that a ruler can very easily win over men who opposed him when he came to power. If they're not in a position to support themselves with their own resources, they'll be forced to behave more loyally than others in that they know they have to work hard to offset the negative impression the ruler initially had on them. So a ruler can always get more out of such men than out of people who feel too safe in his service and don't really make an effort. Since the discussion demands it, I would like to leave out a reminder to any ruler who has taken a new step with the help, with inside help, that he must think hard about why the local people who helped him did so. If they didn't act out of natural friendship for the new ruler, but only because the previous government wasn't giving them what they wanted, it will be extremely demanding and difficult to keep their support because the new ruler won't be able to give them what they want either. Looking carefully at the reasons for this and drawing on the examples available from ancient and modern history, we find that it is much easier to win over those who were content with the previous government and hence your enemies than the men who were not content and so made an alliance with you and helped you to take the country. One way rulers have tried to secure their power is by building fortresses to curb and discourage potential aggressors to offer a, huge a safe refuge in case of sudden attack. I approve of this policy if only because it has been used for centuries all the same there is the recent example of Niccolo Vitelli, who demolished two fortresses in Cita di Castello in order to hold the town. When Guido Baldo retook possession of his lands after Cesare Borgia's occupation, he razed every fortress to, in the state to the ground, convinced that 
he'd be less likely to lose it again without them. And when Bentiv the Bentivoglio family returned to power in Bologna, it did the same thing. So whether fortresses are useful or not will depend on the circumstances. In one situation, they'll be a help, and in another, they'll be dangerous. We can sum up the reasons for this as follows. The ruler who is more afraid of his people than of foreign enemies must build fortresses. But the ruler who is more afraid of foreign armies should do without them. The castle Francesco's, Francesco's forts are built in Milan has provoked and will go on provoking more rebellions against the Sforza family than any other cause of unrest in the whole state. Your best fortress is not to be hated by the people, because even if you do have fortresses, they won't save you if the people hate you. Once the people have decided to take up arms against you, they'll never be short of foreign support. In recent time, times, there are, no, there are no examples of fortresses having proved useful to any ruler at all with the exception of the Countess of Forli, Caterina Sforza. When her husband, Count Girolamo Riario, was murdered, taking refuge in the fort fortress, she was able to survive the rebels' assault, wait till help came from Milan, then take control again. Circumstances were such that, at the time, no foreign enemies were in a position to help the people. Later, however, her fortress were not much use when Cesare Borgi attacked the town, and the people who were hostile to her fought on his side. Both then and earlier, she should have taken safer. She, she, she should have been safer had she avoided making an enemy of the people rather than counting on fortresses. All things considered, I'll give my approval both to rulers who build fortresses and to those who don't. But I'll always criticize any ruler who imagines it doesn't matter whether the people hate him or not and trusts in fortresses for his security. Chapter 21, what a ruler should do to win respect. Nothing wins a ruler respect like great military victories and a display of remarkable personal qualities. One example in our own times is Ferdinand of Aragon, Aragon, the present king of Spain. One might almost describe him as a ruler new to power because of being a weak king, he has become the most famous and honored of Christendom. And when you look at his achievements, you find they are all remarkable and some of them extraordinary. Oh, excuse me, good people. I'm going to start this chapter again. I think I messed up a line over there. Chapter 21. What a ruler should do to win respect. Nothing wins a ruler respect like great military victories and a display of remarkable personal qualities. One example in our own times is Ferdinand of Aragon, the present king of Spain. One might almost describe him as a ruler new to power because from, because from being a weak king, he has become the most famous and honored of Christendom. And when you look at his achievements, you find they are all remarkable and some of them extraordinary. At the beginning of his reign, he launched an invasion of Granada, a campaign that laid the foundation of his, of his power. It was important that he did it at a moment of domestic quiet when he didn't have to worry about possible interruptions. The war then kept the Castilian 
barons busy so that they didn't start plotting changes inside, inside Spain. Meanwhile, and without their even noticing, Ferdinand's power and reputation were increasing at their expense. Supplying his army with money from the church and the people, he was able to sustain a long war that allowed him to establish, then consolidate a military force that would do him proud in the future. After that was done, to ensure the church's support for every larger campaigns, for even larger campaigns, he perpetrated an act of cruelty dressed up as piety, stripping the Marano Jews of their wealth and expelling them from their kingdom, a move that could hardly have been more distressing or striking. Once again, under cover of religion, he attacked Africa, then moved into Italy and finally attacked France. So he was always planning and doing great things, keeping his people in a state of suspense and admiration, concentrated as they were on the outcome of his various campaigns. Since each of these came as a consequence of the one before, he never gave the more powerful men in the country any slack time between wars when they could plot against him. A leader can also win acclaim by giving impressive demonstrations of character in his handling of domestic affairs, as Barnabo Visconti did in Milan. When anyone does anything remarkable, whether for good or ill, in civil life, you think up some reward or punishment that will cause a star. But above all, a ruler must ensure that everything he does gives people the impression that he is a great man of remarkable abilities. A ruler will also be respected when he is a genuine friend and a genuine enemy. That is, when he declares himself unambiguously for one side and against the other. This policy will always bring better results than neutrality. For example, if you have two powerful neighbors who go to war, you may or may not have reason to fear the winner afterwards. Either way, it will always be better to take sides and fight hard. If you do have cause to fear but stay neutral, you'll, st you'll still be gobbled up by the winner to the amusement and satisfaction of the loser you'll have no excuses, no defense, and nowhere to hide. Because a winner doesn't want half-hearted friends who don't help him in a crisis. And the loser will have nothing to do with you since you didn't choose to fight alongside him and share his fate. When Antiochus was sent to Greece by the Aetolians to push back the Romans, he sent ambassadors to the Achaeans who were allied to the Romans, asking them to remain neutral, while for the part of the Romans, encouraged them to join the war on their side. The Achaean council debated the matter and after Antiochus's ambassador had spoken, asking them to remain neutral, the Roman ambassador replied, with regard to this invitation to remain neutral, nothing could be more damaging to your interest. You'll get no thanks no consideration, and will be taken as a reward by whoever wins. The contender who is not your ally will always try to get you to stay neutral, and your ally will always try to get you to fight. Indecisive rulers who want to avoid immediate danger usually decide to stay neutral, and usually things end badly for them. But but if you declare yourself courageously for one side or the other and your ally wins, he'll be indebted to you and there'll be a bond of friendship between you. So that even if he is more powerful now and has, and has you at his mercy, he's, go, he's not going to be so shameless as to take advantage of the circumstances and become an example of ingratitude. Victories are never so decisive that the winner can override every principle, justice in particular. But if your ally loses, you're still his friend 
and he'll offer what help he can. You become companions in misfortune and your luck could always turn. In the event that the two neighbors going to war are not so powerful that you need fear the winner, it is even more sensible to take sides and get involved. You'll be destroying one with the help of another who, if he had any sense, would be protecting the loser. And when your ally wins, which with your help is inevitable, he'll be at your mercy. Here, it's worth noting that a ruler must never ally himself with someone more powerful in order to attack his enemies, unless, as I said above, it's, it is absolutely necessary. Because when you win, you'll be at your ally's mercy. And whenever possible, rulers must avoid placing themselves in another's power. The, Venetia, uh, the Venetians allied themselves with France to attack the Duke of Milan. It was an alliance they could have avoided and it led to disaster. But when such an alliance can't be avoided, as was the case with Florence when the Pope and Spain took their armies to attack Lombardy, then a ruler must take sides for the reasons set out above. In general, a ruler must never imagine that any, any decision he takes is safe. On the contrary, he should reckon that any decision is potentially dangerous. It is in the nature of things that every time you try to avoid one danger, you run into another. Good sense consists in being able to assess the dangers and choose the lesser of the various evils. A ruler must also show that he admires achievement in others, giving work to men of ability and rewarding people who excel in this or that craft. What's more, he should reassure his subjects that they can go calmly, calmly about their business as merchants or farmers or whatever other trade they practice without worrying that if they increase their wealth, they'll be in danger of having it taken away from them. Or that if they start up a business, they'll be punitively taxed. On the contrary, a ruler should offer incentives to people who want to do this kind of thing and to whoever plans to bring prosperity to his city or state. Then at the right times of the year, he should entertain people with shows and festivals. And since every city is divided into guilds and districts, he should respect these groups and go to their meetings from time to time, showing what a humane and generous person he is, though without ever forgetting the authority of his position, something he must always keep to the, fo to the fore. That's chapter 21, good people. That's the chapters for the day. I hope, uh, I hope you like them. If you haven't seen the other chapters or if you, if you would like to check them out, you can go back and uh, watch them. Otherwise, thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for liking the video. Hope you all have a good uh, Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. Stay health, healthy. Stay, uh, stay working out and stuff, you know. Stay moving. Stay moving. I'll see you tomorrow when I read uh, the next few chapters. And uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for watching. Adios, good people.